can't tell with the, ah, here we go, awesome. Okay, well, good morning, thanks for having me. Um, I guess a little bit of, about my, my background, I definitely want to echo what Dr. Floyd said, um, is that my career path was definitely not a straight arrow. <laughs> um, it, I guess my mantra is always map out your future, but do it in pencil. Um, always have a plan. It, you don't necessarily have to carry out the plan to a T, but have something, have, have some sort of goals that you can work towards. Um, I did my undergrad at Tulane. I did my PhD. I did not get a master's degree. I went straight through and got a PhD at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So we might know a few people in common. Um, and I did a postdoc for a year at UAB. Um, and for my PhD work, <laughs> I guess my trajectory was kind of meandering too. I did my, my PhD work with um, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So my, my PhD was very clinical in nature. And when I told uh, my advisors that I wanted to get more into environmental science, just do more of a microbial ecology approach, they said that that was the dumbest idea they'd ever heard that, you know, who would want to do that? You know, obviously they were, they had a clinical background, so they, they were biased, but um, I, I think it, it turned out well, and I did a postdoc at the University of Southern Mississippi, and then uh, three years ago I came here as an assistant professor. So I've, I've pretty much stayed in the South. Um, I guess another piece of advice is, you know, I don't want to tell you guys that grades are overrated, but you'd, grades are not always reflective of your passion. I did not have the best grades. At one point I was actually on academic probation because I had such bad grades, but my passion, I was really excited about science. Um, I wasn't that good at math, but I really loved biology, microbiology. I had, you know, mediocre grades, and I had mentors along the way who, or I guess supposed mentors who told me, you know, maybe you're not cut out for this. Maybe you're not smart enough to get your PhD. And, you know, I don't know if that was sort of reverse psychology that was supposed to make me mad and force me to go ahead and get my PhD, but, don't ever let people tell you that you're not good enough, that you're not passionate, or that you're not maybe cut out for it, maybe it's not your niche, just based on your grades. Don't ever let your grades be, uh, I guess, your, your calling card. Um, passion, hard work, a lot of hard work, sometimes long hours, really matter, really make the difference. And so if you guys have any questions, um, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about my, my research, but stop me at any time. Um, when I'm lecturing, I always tell people, jump in at any time, because if you wait until the end, um, you may not even remember the question, and frankly, I may not even remember what I said, so interrupt me at, at any moment. Okay, so vibrios are bacteria. If you ever have gone to the beach, you walk around in the water, you play in the sand, there are tons and tons of bacteria in the ocean. For the most part, we don't know anything about those bacteria. Um, but there are some that are human pathogens. They have the ability to not only make people sick, but cause people to die. They can cause massive outbreaks, especially in developing countries. And so one of the, I guess, overarching research questions that I have is what makes these bacteria behave? And I, I use air quotes when I say behave because obviously bacteria don't have brains to think, but they do respond to environmental stimuli. They know whether it's warm or cold and they react accordingly. Okay, so vibrios are uh, gram-negative bacteria, so if you look at them under a microscope, they're going to be pink. Um, they are halophilic, so halo being salt, bile being loving, so they're salt loving, which means they're naturally found and naturally comfortable in the ocean. Uh, they're unlike most bacteria. If you throw E. coli out in the ocean, at most they might last a few hours to two, up to two weeks. But for the most part, other bacteria that you're probably more accustomed to are just not going to survive in high salt uh, conditions. So they occur naturally. People um, who are exposed to vibrios have often eaten raw oysters. I'm not sure if you guys actually eat raw oysters. I get the question a lot, do I eat raw oysters? And the question is, has nothing to do with, the answer has nothing to do with the bacteria. It's the texture. I don't necessarily like the slimy texture of oysters. But if you have ever known someone who ate raw oysters and they had some problems uh, later down the line, uh, often it's, it's probably a vibrio if it's not a norovirus. Um, and vibrio infections are more frequent in Asian countries where consumption of raw or undercooked seafood is, is more prevalent. Okay, so there are three main pathogens, vibrio vulnificus, 
Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio cholerae. So Vibrio is the genus name. These are the species, three different species. So you can think of them as three different cousins. Um, they cause similar effects, uh, such as gastroenteritis, but they, they have their own sort of personalities. So Vibrio vulnificus, um, if you've ever heard of a, a fisherman who maybe had a, a cut on his hand or his or her hand or arm or, or foot one day and had to have their leg amputated or their arm amputated the next day, that's probably Vibrio vulnificus. It has, it's, it's the nastiest of the, Vibrio, of the Vibrios. Um, so for example here, it has a, it's unique among bacteria in that it has a case fatality rate of up to 50%. So if you have, if you're immunosuppressed and you're, uh, you're exposed to Vibrio vulnificus and it ends up in your blood, there's a one in two chance that you might die if you don't get treated quickly. So that's why I told the people who work in my lab, if you have a cut, uh, don't ignore it. It's, this is not you know, a staph infection. This is you know, potentially, you could, you could lose your arm and that could make it really hard to pipette and run gels <laughs> later, which is all I care about. <laughs> but Vibrio vulnificus, um, like the other Vibrios, causes gastroenteritis, which is characterized by diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain but it mostly causes wound infections and it can lead to sepsis, which is a blood infection where the bacteria end up in your blood. Um, it causes uh, fever, chills, septic shock, and blistering skin lesions, which I'm about to show you some pretty gross pictures. But Vibrio, Vibrio vulnificus, if you start to, uh, if you think you've been exposed to a Vibrio and you see blistering skin lesions, you see blisters on your lower extremities, immediately go to the hospital because there's a possibility, possibility that you, you could have your, your leg amputated. Okay. So these are some of the blisters. Um, Volnificus is unique in that it, it tends to cause these pus, pustules, these, these lesions on the lower extremities, presumably because uh, blood flow is, is not as, as good in the lower extremities. It also can enter through open wounds. So I had an old mentor, not one of the ones who told me I was not smart enough to get a PhD, but a, a really good mentor. He had a sister who was a breast cancer survivor. So she'd been exposed to chemotherapy and she had shaved her le legs and they had gone to the beach. And she got just a little bit, she, she knew that she was immunocompromised. She knew better than to go into the beach, but she got a little bit of seawater on her legs and those tiny little cuts led to a Vibrio infection and she almost lost her leg just from the tiny cuts from shaving her legs. So Vibrio vulnificus can be very powerful. The second um, cousin is Vibrio parahemolyticus. This is the one which is the, it's more common, it's more, more prevalent uh, in the US. We, we tend to not see as many vulnificus infections. We see lots more parahemolyticus infections. So it causes gastroenteritis, uh, sepsis, and wound infections. It's the most frequent in the US. Again, uh, people who eat uh, raw oysters. And the reason oysters are, are a hot thing um, is because oysters are filter feeders. So when they're feeding, they're sucking in water to feed themselves, but they're also sucking in these naturally occurring bacteria. And you know, we, we talk about human pathogens. The vast majority, if you go to the beach, if you take a drop of water, 99% of the bacteria in that water are never going to cause human infections. But it's that 1%, that one, that subpopulation that, that can be really bad, that can cause global pandemics. And that's the one that we care about. So after Hurricane Katrina, there were actually five deaths in evacuees due to Vibrio infections. And this was unique because usually, you know, not knowing the scenario, most epidemiologists would have guessed that they were Vibrio vulnificus infections. And it turns out two were from VP. So VP can cause wound infections, but it usually just causes diarrhea. The problem goes away, you take some, uh, I don't know, or milk of magnesia and it goes away. Okay, so um, when, when you want to ask a question, you know, how do the vibrios, how do bacteria respond to environmental parameters, you have to measure these vibrios because sometimes there's a lot of them in that drop of water and sometimes there's not very many. Vibrios respond to temperature. So in the summer, which is you know, right now, vibrios are really at, at their highest levels um, you have to be able to accurately quantify. And so the way we quantify is we look for specific genes that are only found in Vibrio parahemolyticus or specific genes that are only found in Vibrio vulnificus. So one of the genes that we look at is called the thermolabile homolysin. So hemo being <coughs> blood, 
lysin being lysed, so this is a molecule that can lyse red blood cells. Um, so I'm going to talk about TLH, but I'm also going to talk about two other homolysins, TDH, thermostable direct homolysin, thermo being heat, stable being stable. This means that this molecule not only has the ability to lyse your red blood cells, but if you heat it up, so for example, if you cook the oyster, it can still make you sick. It can still lyse your red blood cells. So that's very powerful. And the thing about Vibrio's, um, I guess a lot of scientists, and I guess this is a good visual, but a lot of scientists call them promiscuous because they're in the environment, they're constantly exchanging genetic material. It's called horizontal gene transfer. There's no limit between bacteria that limits them from exchanging genetic material. A lot of the genes, uh, for example, antibiotic resistance genes, these homolysin genes that make the, the bacteria more powerful, don't just limit themselves to certain species. They jump all over the place because they're in the environment. Um, they acquire genes uh, externally with no problem. So there are two genes, TDH and TRH. So this is a, a relative of the TDH. These are the two pathogenicity genes. So if you see these two genes, you're in trouble because this means that it has the ability to cause diarrhea um, and possibly worse. Okay. So there are several research questions. Um, how can we account for viable but non-culturable vibrios? Like I said earlier, the vast majority of the bacteria, not just the vibrios, but the bacteria in the ocean, we don't know a thing about. We can't grow them. We don't know what's required. We don't know what sugars, what proteins. We can't, we can't analyze them because to analyze bacteria, you kind of need to be able to grow them. But there are, there are ways around that. Um, vibrios enter what's called a viable but non-culturable state. That means they're dormant, they're, the cells kind of shrink up, but they still have the ability to kill you um, if they have the other pathogenicity genes. And so how do you account for that? If you can't grow it, then you're, you're going to miss half the story. You're going to miss half the bacteria that can, can, that can cause disease. How do eukaryotic systems respond to VP? What was the impact of the, the oil spill? I'm not sure if you, if you guys are mostly from here or you've heard about the oil spill. Okay, all right, good. Um, how prevalent are, we have new, newly described pathogenicity factors. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the type 3 secretion system in a minute. How do the Vibrio densities vary? So we've got a lot of collaborators in Maryland, Mississippi, Seattle. Um, and the, I was telling you how right now Vibrio levels are really, really, really high in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, but that's not necessarily the case in Seattle, for example, where it's a little bit cooler. Uh, it's usually a little bit cooler. They've had some warm trends here lately. Um, and uh, one of the big things is we know that temperature impacts uh, this behavior that I've been talking about. We know that vibrios can sense when it's warm and so they, they grow like crazy. However, temperature is not the only uh, environmental factor that impacts whether the vibrios um, are at high levels or low levels. Salinity, how turbid the water is. So if you've ever been to the Louisiana coast, you, you wade out into the water and by the time the water's up to your ankle, you can't even see your toes. That's very highly turbid water. Whereas if you were in Maryland, you could wade out to your waist and still be able to see your toes. So the turbidity of the water is an indication of there's stuff in the water. And vibrios, like most bacteria, like they're sticky. So you know you drop some food, <laughs> you drop something, that the two second rule, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily apply because bacteria are sticky. They like to stick to stuff. So when you've got water that's very turbid, that water is more likely to have high levels of bacteria. Okay, and so we're looking at other parameters. So we go out, um, we collect water, oysters, and sediment. Uh, we do that in Louisiana, Mississippi, Seattle, and Maryland, and Chesapeake Bay. We streak them out. Um, we shake the water 25 times in a seven second period. So basically we shake the crap out of the water to make it sort of a homogeneous mixture. Um, we dilute the sediment. We don't dilute the water, but we take, we shuck the oysters, and that's always a lot of fun because if you've ever shucked an oyster, it's, there are certain muscles that you don't use for anything else and you're sore the next day and there's usually a lot of profanity involved because it's really hard. But we shuck the oysters and we put it all in a blender and we make what I call an oyster smoothie. Um, we don't, we don't drink it, but it's, Basically, it's a homogenate that we dilute, and we, uh, that allows the bacteria in the oyster and in the oyster tissue to grow. Okay, so basically we want to let the bacteria grow, and the next day we come in and 
we look for certain genes and we quantify those genes. Okay. Um, and then the genes, we uh, use a statistical method to um, correlate the levels of those bacteria with temperature, salinity, turbidity, chlorophyll, other pigments, and other environmental factors. So this all feeds into an ecological model that can be used to predict when levels are going to be high. And so if you can use remote sensing to detect, okay, you know, temperature is this, salinity is that, if you can identify signatures that say, okay, vibrio levels are likely to be high when temperature is this, salinity is that, then you can use remote sensing to predict, sorry, to predict when vibrio levels are high, and you can do that in, uh, in developing countries. So in Bangladesh, for example, where there may not necessarily be a microbiology lab with molecular tools, you can use remote sensing because the satellites pass over Bangladesh, for example, and you can predict when there's uh, gonna be a Vibrio perihemolyticus outbreak or a cholera outbreak. And so that's really important. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier, uh, looking at the VBNC, so that's the dormant bacteria that still have the ability to cause diarrhea. Um, Culture-based methods alone under-detect these vibrios, and so we can use fluorescence methods that target the genes inside the cells. And this is a novel method. It's called ringfish, recognition of individual gene fluorescence in situ hybridization. Basically, um, we target a gene with a short piece of DNA, and that DNA uh, grows outside of the cell and it forms a ring around the cell. And so that those pieces of DNA have fluorescent pieces, fluorescent nucleotides inside them, and that's what allows the cells to grow. So this is developed by uh, Kim Griffith at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, another question is how do eukaryotic systems respond? Bacteria, um, including vibrios, they don't care or know what, what their environment is. They could be inside an oyster, they could be inside a human gut cell, they could be inside or attached to a piece of sediment. They don't know where they are. So that's why I think, I think what I do is unique because you know, given my clinical background, I can appreciate the fact that vibrios aren't thinking about where they are. They're simply responding to environmental stimuli. Okay, so following the uh, oil spill, uh, a collaborator of mine, Dr. Ed Laws, discovered a phytoplankton that actually grew better in oil when exposed to the, the oil that we got from the wellhead than it did under natural conditions. So uh, he's actually looking at various phytoplankton extracts, uh, chemicals that we get from the phytoplankton for antimicrobial activity. So basically this is one of his bottles. Uh, he grew it up in 100 parts per million uh, deep water horizon oil. This is from uh, September of 2010. Andrew Cowan, who was uh, an HHMI participant last year, actually did some studies and we're hoping to continue these studies looking at these bacteria um, exposed to oysters. So Oysters are, you know, like people, they have an immune system. They have the ability to fight off infection, to fight off invaders. And so since they're constantly colonized by vibrios, we wanted to look at the oyster immune cells, which are called hemocytes, and how they respond to, to various vibrios, whether uh, those vibrios have uh, pathogenicity factors uh, or not. And we also wanted to compare triploid oysters to diploid oysters. Triploid oysters are uh, oysters that have been modified to have um, to have um, triple chromosomes, basically. And what, what's unique about triploid oysters is they, because they have triple chromosomes, they can't replicate themselves, and so they become fatter and fatter. Um, and so they're being developed now as a possible food source. And one of the things about making mutants is um, the, the fear that the mutant that you make might end up in the environment. Um, triploids are unique in that if they ended up in the environment, they would just grow and die. They would not replicate. Okay. Um, I mentioned some of the newer uh, pathogenicity factors that are being discovered. One of them is the type 3 secretion system. So basically, um, bacteria that have the type 3 secretion system have this sort of needle complex. So they have a needle that uh, is extruded from their, their cell walls into eukaryotic systems. And so this needle sticks out of the bacteria and injects 
uh, proteins, injects molecules inside eukaryotic cell systems, and those proteins are called effector proteins, and basically these effector proteins mimic the eukaryotic protein, so they basically have the ability to bind to sites that otherwise uh, natural intermediates would bind to. So basically, uh, these bacteria that have the type 3 secretion system are tricking eukaryotic cells into thinking that, um, for example, they're blocking the immune response. So the, the bacteria are smart. They have the ability to stop eukaryote, eukaryotic cells from responding to them um, immunologically, if that makes any sense. And so uh, what we discovered, in, or what was discovered in 2003 was that um, Vibrio perihemolyticus has two chromosomes, but it has two type 3 secretion systems. Most bacteria only have one type 3 secretion system. So this is really exciting because uh, on chromosome 1 it has a TTSS1, and on chromosome 2 it has a TTSS2. And so that TTSS2 is not like any other type 3 secretion system we've ever seen. So it's really exciting. The problem with these the needle complex, I mean, look at it. It has a lot of different parts. Most of the type 3 secretion system gene systems have 20 or 30 genes. So if you're going to make a mutation, it's, it's like mutating a table. If you take out one leg, it's not going to behave like a normal table. So you have to be very careful how you make the mutants. And so we haven't quite gotten to that yet. But we have looked at the preponderance, how prevalent this type 3 secretion system is in naturally occurring bacteria. Okay, so uh, one of the uh, PhD students who has since gotten his PhD looked at um, environmental and clinical isolates in, in vitro. So basically he took oyster hemocytes and he took a human cell line. So <clears throat> the cells are called CACO2 cells and they're basically human intestinal cell lines that have been immortalized so that you can study them uh, in vitro. And he found that VP, Vibrio perihemolyticus containing a certain, a certain type of type 3 secretion system, TTSS2 alpha, were better, uh, were, uh, were as good as those containing TTSS2 beta at killing uh, CACO2 cells. And, but the TRH positive TDH minus, so uh, Vibrio perihemolyticus containing one of the pathogenicity factors but not the other, um, were better at killing than were those that contained TDH and TRH. So basically, you know, I guess the, the, the take home message here is that more is not better. Just because you have more pathogenicity genes does not necessarily make you better at killing cells. And if you really think about it, that makes sense because the more genes a, back, a, a cell has, the more it has to replicate. And so it takes longer to replicate. That gene may not be as fit as genes, that, that cell may not be as fit as cells that have less material. So more is not necessarily better when you're looking at uh, killing of eukaryotic cells. He also wanted to take a transcriptomics approach. So what genes are turned on in the vibrios, or in Vibrio perihemolyticus, when they're exposed to these two cell types? And one of the surprises, so we, uh, we participated in this program called the Pathogen Functional Genomics Research Center, which is now defunct, unfortunately. Basically, we got these chips these gene chips for free, um, and they don't make them anymore, unfortunately. But it allowed us to look at um, the expression of genes, whether genes were turned on or turned off um, under certain conditions, so at certain temperatures, at certain salinities, but in this case, after exposure to certain types of eukaryotic cells. And so one of the surprises, uh, the hypothesis <laughs> was wrong. We, we hypothesized that the um, when you expose the Vibrio perihemolyticus, the bacteria, to eukaryotic cells, it's those pathogenicity genes that would get turned on or turned off. That wasn't the case at all. It turned out that in order for VP to kill eukaryotic cells, it was the metabolic genes. So if you think about metabolism, you have to eat. You have to be able to take in nutrients and break them down. It was the metabolic genes that responded the most and not the pathogenicity genes. So that was really cool. Sort of a, I guess, a paradigm shift there. Um, this is just looking at uh, Texas. 2103 is a, a strain that was that we actually look at in my lab. Um, it's it's a clinical strain from a Galveston outbreak from 
I want to say 1997, um, I think two to 300 people were, were sickened. And AQ is another strain. So basically looking at two clinical strains, it was the metabolism genes um, that dominated in response to being exposed to those cells. Um, and hypothetical genes came in number two. So that, that's really exciting because there are a lot of genes, whenever a genome is sequenced, a lot of genes, we don't know what they do. We don't know if they actually do anything, if they're regulatory. Um, and so those, often they're called hypothetical genes because um, based on their similarity to other genes. So if you, let's say, sequence a gene, a 500 base pair gene, and it looks like another gene, then you call it hypothetically a lactase gene um, or, or you know, whatever the, the gene is similar to. Um, second, were regulatory genes, uh, transcription and secretion genes, motility genes. So what really surprised us was the fact that the virulence genes or the pathogen pathogenicity genes came in dead last. So these pathogenicity genes that we give so much credit to don't actually do anything when they're exposed to eukaryotic cells. So that's pretty cool. We, th we thought that was pretty cool. Okay, so th uh, this is basically a summary of, of what I just told you. Okay, so we had an oil spill. Um, <laughs> when you are doing environmental sampling, you have to uh, sometimes make lemonade. We were, ma <laughs> we were making lemonade here. Our sample sites, uh, we had two sample sites in Mississippi, Deer Island and Grand Bay Near, which is actually very close to Alabama, and two sites, Cocodri and Port Fouchon here in Louisiana. Obviously, the oil spill impacted at least one of our sites. So we decided, okay, we're going to make lemonade. We've got all this baseline data, so we're in a prime position to determine what impact does the BP oil spill have? Sorry, I shouldn't call it the BP oil spill. It's the Deepwater Horizon spill. What impact did the oil spill have on the vibrios? Did it increase the vibrios? Did we see a massive increase of pathogenicity genes? Or did it do nothing at all? Or do we see that the oil is killing the bacteria? It turns out um, the results were not as exciting. There was no significant difference between the pre-spill isolates and the post-spill isolates. If anything, um, the, the uh, oil spill might have killed off some of the potential pathogens. We did see some slight differences in the types. So one of the things I do um, is, I guess, uh, the analogy I like to, to use is uh, paternity testing for bacteria. Determining the phylogenetic relationships among bacteria. You know, what are the types? What are their genetic fingerprints. So we do some uh, genetic fingerprinting. We did genetic fingerprinting on pre and post isolates. So there was a bit of a shift um, before, from before and after the oil spill. So there was, there was a slight change in the population, but there was not this massive increase. Uh, doom and gloom, the newspaper articles were all saying, oh my God, we're all, we're all gonna die. We're gonna see this increase in, in you know, human pathogens, and that just didn't happen. Um, not as exciting for me as a microbiologist, but great if you're a beach goer in Louisiana after the oil spill. Um, this is a, another uh, H, last year, an HHMI participant, David Sliman, um, who has actually since transferred to USM. He looked at the in vitro growth rates of bacteria uh, exposed to oil. And this is actually something we, we may continue. Um, Okay, um, this is just uh, doing a, a survey of the isolate, the Vibrio parahemolyticus isolates that have the TDH and or TRH pathogenicity factors, so the, the old fashioned or the previously described pathogenicity factors, screening them for the type 3 secretion system. And so what we found was, you know how I told you there are two type 3 secretion systems? One on the big chromosome on the bottom, the TTSS1, that TTSS1 is, it's kind of typical, it's kind of boring, it's found in other bacteria, it's not really unique, but that TTSS2, the one on the smaller chromosome, that's the one that's really exciting. It's not like anything else. Well, no surprise, we found that the T3SS1, or TTSS1, was ubiquitous. So, yeah, no surprise there. But the T3SS2 alpha correlated with the TDH positive TRH minus isolates and the TTSS2 beta correlated with TDH minus and TRH positive strains. So that was really interesting. 
because we could discern the two type 3 secretion systems. And this had not ever been done before. Um, the overarching project uh, is what I was telling you about. How do the abundances or densities of vibrios vary from coast to coast? So, for example, if you know how I was telling you, remote sensing can be used to detect temperature, detect um, salinity to some degree, detect turbidity of the water. The temperature, the signature that we developed on the Louisiana coast, we can't necessarily use that same signature in Bangladesh. We have to, to develop that signature in multiple geographic locations. So, for example, the turbidity in Chesapeake Bay is going to be completely different than the, the turbidity in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we are collaborating with uh, at four different sites, and we are looking at temperature, salinity, dissolved organic carbon, suspended particulate matter, which is a metric for how turbid the water is, how much stuff is suspended in the water. And we have been sampling, had been sampling for a very long time. We actually just completed the sampling. And so what we find, um, not sure how much you guys can get out of this, but the um, blue squares here are uh, the amount of, all of these are, data are for Vibrio perihemolyticus levels. The levels in water in Washington were low. The levels in oysters were a lot higher, and the levels in sediment were even higher. Um, however, when you compare that to Louisiana and Mississippi data, that's totally different. The levels of bacteria in Washington are a lot lower just because it's cold. You know how I was telling you temperature impacts whether these guys come out to play and in Maryland. So basically, we're developing the same uh, model, the same ecological model, or identifying the same uh, ecological signature in four different sites. And so that strengthens the overall model because it maximizes our ability to use it in Bangladesh or India or Japan. Um, so this is, this is really just illustrating the strength of doing the study in various sites. If we only did the site, the study in Washington, we would be, <coughs> excuse me, very limited in terms of the sea surface temperature. We would only see a smaller range of sea surface temperatures. But doing it in four different sites really maximizes the, the number of temperatures, the number of salinities, the number of various environmental parameters that we can look at. So the real, one of the real strengths of this, of this project is looking at um, wide ranges of environmental parameters. Another thing we found, and we, we really don't know why, um, Washington, okay, you know how I was saying in a given drop of water, uh, looking at just VP, Vibrio perihemolyticus, 99% of the bacteria in a drop of water of the VP are never going to cause problems. They're never going to cause massive outbreaks, but it's that 1% subpopulation. What we found, and you know, we still don't really know the answer, in Washington, the levels were really high, 30 to 40 percent of the, of, the path of the total population were actually pathogenic. Really bad if you are an oyster consumer in the Pacific Northwest, and we have no idea why. Um, one of the hypotheses is that, you know how I was saying that vibrios are promiscuous, they are constantly exchanging genetic material? Maybe this pathogenicity gene, these TDHs and TRHs, jumped into another organism and maybe we're detecting that other organism. So we're looking at, we're investigating in, into that, um, at least they are in, in the Pacific Northwest uh, in Seattle. We don't know. We don't know. So that, that kind of threw a monkey wrench um, in the study. Um, okay, so this is the, um, these are the results of the model. So basically this says um, that, uh, so for example, looking at suspended particulate, mat suspended particulate matter accounted for 15.56% of the variability. So when you're developing, or at least when we're developing this model, the question is how much does temperature contribute? How much does salinity uh, contribute? And so all of this can be developed into a really fancy formula that can be posted on a website, for example. So if you enter a certain temperature, a certain salinity, you can get, um, a feed, you can get feedback on what are the chances that I'm going to get sick today. What are the chances that these oysters are going to have high levels of vibrios today? And, um, and you know, again, this is just looking at the TDHs and TRHs. Um, okay. When, <laughs> when I was in grad school, uh, I participated in a program called uh, the GK12 program. So basically it was a National Science Foundation program, and I 
taught high school and junior high school students. And it was very um, character building because high school students and junior high school students, their hormones are out of whack. They, you know, these were um, needy kids. These were kids that were at risk. Um, when I took the Drosophila, the fruit fly vials, they would throw them at each other. They would throw three, four hundred dollar pipettes at each other. It was, <laughs> it, it felt like I was in a war zone. But I, I think the experience, I did it for three years. Um, it was, it was character building because it taught me to, um, taught me how to talk to people who don't necessarily care about what I do. And so one of the slides that I always include whenever I give a talk is why, why should I care? Who cares? You know, who really cares about this and why should I care? Because I taught students who often had their arms folded and, and you know, just the body language screamed, I don't care, leave me alone, I don't want to talk about it, I'm really not interested. And so I try to, um, I try to make it interesting and explain to people why you should care. So can you guys tell me, based on this uh, a little bit outdated slide uh, from 1989, why should you care? Why should we care about Vibrios? And this is kind of unique to Louisiana. What, what do you notice about Louisiana? Millions and millions of pounds of oysters. You know, it's funny, I was in actually, um, yeah, I guess I was in Baltimore a few years ago, and they had signs in restaurants, we've got Louisiana oysters. That was a source of pride for them because Louisiana oysters are so popular, they're so prevalent, and apparently so tasty. I don't know, uh, I don't do the whole oyster thing, but supposedly they're, it's a big deal. And they, Louisiana oysters drew a, a higher value, and so they, they charge more for Louisiana oysters. But Louisiana uh, was and continues to be the number one producer of oysters destined for raw consumption. If you're a raw oyster eater, you need to know how high the levels of vibrios are, how dangerous are these vibrios. And that's why you should care, because there are scientists out there who are testing these oysters, not just for viruses, not just for you know, how they taste, whether they're spawning or not, but actual human pathogens, which are the number one pathogen, number one reason why oysters are harmful. Okay, thanks to everyone. Uh, it takes a village. We have a lot of collaborators who have helped um, on this project, uh, helped in the field, and especially to the National Science Foundation. And these are the people, some of the people in my lab. I was not able to get a picture of one, of one particular student, uh, Emma Ira Dukunda, and she uh, is working on the phytoplankton project that I was telling you about. And this is Henry. He helps us <laughs> when we go out in the field. He helps us sample oysters. Now he's, he's just the, an alligator that, that loiters, uh, not necessarily at a level of comfort that, that I'm, I'm at, but he, he, he likes marshmallows. Um, but he's, he's sort of our mascot. But these are you know, various action shots. But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take some now. Thank you. That's a, a, an excellent question. There is a unique color. The third uh, about this is causing problems. Uh, Vibrio cholera does actually live in freshwater. It not only lives and thrives; it prefers freshwater. So not all of the vibrios prefer salt water. That's a very good question. Very good question. Thank. You. Yes, yeah. Um, the, the question is, uh, in the water droplets, in the water samples, did we use real time to quantify the vibrios? And the answer is yes, we did. And, uh, 
the, the question is, the primer sets that we use to amplify the TDH, the TD, TRH, all the various genes, do we make those or do we buy them? We buy them. Actually, shockingly, primers are, are $5, $6. They're super cheap. What makes real-time PCR so expensive is, um, one, the probe, because real-time PCR requires a probe in the middle to make it more specific, and it's got a quencher and a fluorophore that, that any time you're working with fluorescence, it's re it, you, you really uh, increase the cost of the experiment. But the answer is that we buy them from idtdna.com. Uh, they were like five, six dollars. And we did not design those primers. I, I have to give credit to the FDA. Uh, the FDA has been working on this for, for many, many years, uh, probably a couple of decades. And they were the ones who designed the primers, the probes. So all this has been worked out for us, luckily. Uh, but we can design primers. It's just why <laughs> if someone's already worked it out for us. Uh, it's just more convenient to use a tried and true set of primers, especially if it's used by the FDA, who is monitoring oyster beds. It's a good question. Any other questions? That's a good question. It would not surprise me if it's not unique. I'd be shocked if that's not the case for other bacteria. That's a very good point. I, I imagine if we carried out the same study with E. coli or salmonella, we would get the same response. You have to be able to eat and grow before you can turn on these, path these extra accessory genes, you know, uh, pathogenicity genes or antibiotic resistance genes. Those are just accessories. The fundamentals are your ability to, to feed yourself, to eat, to, to survive and replicate. It's a good question. Uh, Bargu? No, we don't. Um, oddly, <laughs> I have an appointment with her on Thursday. She is taking some Vibrio strains from us. She wants to look at, um, I think she wants to start a phytoplankton project looking at the interaction between phytoplankton and Vibrios. Yeah, she's, she's a very good person to collaborate with. She's super smart. <laughs>